let me talk about the centrality of energy. Uh, I want to talk with you about energy and sustainability management. Uh, and again, just as I have in the other chapters in the book, when I talk about it, first I talk about the technical, technological challenges. What are the technologies that we have to focus on? Then there's the issue of finance. And all of this new technology and infrastructure costs money. So where is it going to come from? The fourth issue is the issue of organizational capacity. If we have the technology and we have the money, we still have to have the capacity to train people to know how to do this in enough places. And finally, what's the role of government and public policy uh, to bring this all about faster than the market will bring it about on its own? Now, there are people who will tell you, well, the automobile didn't need government intervention. Nonsense. Who do you think built the roads? Where did the money come from for the roads? It was taxes on gasoline. It wasn't by magic. Who put in the traffic lights? Okay, Same government, not magic. Who hired the cops to give out the traffic tickets when people were driving too fast or crossing the red lights without stopping? It's this idea that you hear over and over again that government doesn't play a role in the development of private enterprise here in the United States is ludicrous. It really needs to be dismissed. It's an ideological artifact of a previous time that never was even true then. Uh, government has always played a role in economic development. So does the private sector. And so here's a little secret. I'll say this a number of times this semester. The war between the communists and the capitalists is over. And both won because we actually need the free enterprise system to create wealth and to motivate people, and we need government to make sure that we don't kill ourselves off in the competition for wealth and to stimulate new technologies and make them happen. So let's talk about energy and sustainability management. The heart of the sustainability issue is energy. And I really believe this very strongly. Unless we end our dependence on fossil fuel, we cannot develop a long-term sustainable economy. Now, one of, the, one of the students mentioned to me that it's true that uh, there's a lot of new natural gas coming online, and it's very inexpensive, and it's, it can be less polluting. But it also is a hydrocarbon. It also emits a certain amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and it is also finite. There may be 100 or 200 years of this stuff around, but it, that's not forever. And if we can think of, and getting it out of the ground is not always cost free environmentally. Uh, and so we need to think about another energy path. But we need to uh, worry about the fossil fuels emissions. We need to worry about the environmental damage of extraction. Uh, the Gulf oil spill is an example of that. There's lots of other examples of it. When you hoist fossil fuels out of the ground, it doesn't do good things to the ground. You know, It's not so good for the fish and the other aquatic life uh, in the Gulf of Mexico right now, um, nor will it be for a while. The other thing is pure economic supply and demand. And again, it's not going to happen in your lifetime. But it's true that these fuels are finite. As they get more scarce, their price will go up. Since the sun and nuclear power or other kinds of high-tech solutions will not necessarily get more expensive as time goes on, they can actually get less expensive. What you want to do is get on the same cost curve that computing has gotten on, where as you apply new technology, it gets cheaper and cheaper to get more and more of the technology delivered. Some kinds of, of technologies will develop over time and lower prices where, again, natural resources on this planet are never going to expand. Now, someday maybe we'll be on other planets, but we haven't figured it out yet. So if we can develop low-cost renewable energy, we can overcome many of the constraints on economic development and go a long way to solving the sustainability problem. Now, why is this so important? It's important because modern life requires energy. You know, this idea that we're going to sit alone in the dark and the cold in the winter 
and the heat in the summer and do nothing, and that's going to be a sustainable uh, economic life for us is nonsense. People won't accept it. It would be politically destabilizing. We like the lights, uh, the TV, the iPods, the climate control, all that other stuff. And everybody else in the world that gets exposed to it likes it. And there's a reason for it. It makes our lives more comfortable and more interesting. Okay? It's not a mystery. It's a fundamental fact. What is less rec well recognized, I think, is that our system for growing, delivering food, and distributing water also requires massive amounts of energy. Uh, there are fewer than 1% of the population in the United States involved in, in delivering and growing food for us now, down from about 40% at the beginning of the 20th century. And what we've done is we've replaced human labor and energy with uh, artificial, uh, me mechanized labor and energy, massive energy use. Those huge tractors are replacing lots and lots of animals and people that used to toil in the fields, and they're much more efficient and they produce a whole lot more food. So if we solve the energy problem, we solve the sustainability problem. Now I admit I have a bias towards solar energy. I believe it's the transformative technological fix. I don't dismiss the idea of nuclear, but I think you have to have a nuclear that doesn't produce waste and doesn't potentially produce material that can be used in bombs. So you need a different kind of nuclear power. Now, one of the problems with nuclear power as we use it in the world is that after the devastation of World War II's two nuclear explosions, Dwight Eisenhower and other people in the United States decided to do something called Atoms for Peace. They wanted to show that this technology would not just destroy cities, but could also be used for good. And we could have electricity, which they said at that time would be, quote, too cheap to meter. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So, I believe that solar power is a more accessible form, but I won't dismiss the idea of nuclear power if we could overcome the current problems with it. But we need low cost, less capital intensive, decentralized, and less polluting energy. Now those are all different things. Low cost, I want it to be cheap, less capital intensive, meaning solutions that don't require massive infrastructure uh, interventions like the Bogota subway system. Oh, it's a bus system, okay? We didn't have to dig. We didn't have to spend fortunes of money digging up the city. We just figured out a clever way of getting around that constraint. Decentralized, meaning that if we can create something that's less capital intensive and small scale, if you could generate all the power you needed for your home inside your home, that would be a pretty nice low capital, potentially decentralized strategy. Wouldn't that be nice? What do you think the electric utilities would say if you started doing that? It would be like you know, the Roger Rabbit movie only for uh, electricity. So what's the technological challenge of energy? The technological challenge is that the US energy system is characterized by large scale, capital intensive, centralized facilities. So I'm calling for the opposite of that. Small scale, less capital intensive, and decentralized. So that's what I'd like to see. I don't know if it's feasible, but that's what I'd like to see. Electricity currently is generated by coal for the most part in the United States, other fossil fuels, some nuclear, a little bit of hydropower, transmitted largely through a very complicated and antiquated grid system uh, that we're hopefully going to modernize. Transportation is less centralized through local gasoline distribution, but still has huge infrastructure needs in roads. Now, other nations like France, I mean, over, I think, 75% of the energy in France is generated by nuclear. Uh, and so it is possible to think about other technological bases. Uh, the reason we don't have that in this country is more political than anything else, which is to say that uh, France has a highly centralized form of government. We have a very decentralized form of government where local states, states and local governments have enormous power, particularly to veto land uses, and nobody after a certain point wanted one of these nuclear power plants next door. In fact, in Long Island, we built one at Shoreham, and we decommissioned it, and people in Long Island are still paying 
the capital costs of that power plant, which has never generated any electricity whatsoever. It was closed down due to political opposition. What are the technical issues? How do we develop renewable energy sources that are clean and cost effective when compared to fossil fuels? Can we develop a small, low cost solar cell and a battery for storing electricity once we generate it? Now here's what's interesting about this. And I use this example a lot when I talk about solar. When I was in graduate school, I used a computer that was about, I don't know, a quarter of the size of this room uh, and had less computing power than this, okay? Uh, the mainframes in the 1970s uh, were uh, the best we had at that time. I used to go to the computer center at three in the morning with my punch cards and try to get a data run brought back to me within two hours that today you could do in a couple of keystrokes on your laptop and get your output in about a half a second, okay? Now that's the technology in about 30 years of development of computing technology. So today, a solar array is $30,000 and sits on your rooftop and they're pretty big, sort of like the old mainframes, okay? What if the solar cell, uh, that, the solar uh, array that you used 20 years from now with the size of a window pane and the battery that you had could store the electricity in that solar cell to power your whole house all the time, rain or shine, okay? Is it unimaginable? Of course it's not. It could be done, okay? And if it was done, you would have a decentralized, less capital intensive uh, form of energy. You know, if you had talked about computing power to an academic in the 1970s, you would have assumed that for typical computing uses, you would need highly centralized, capital intensive computing facilities with lots of guys with white coats in clean rooms making sure that the computer was kept perfectly at 50 degrees of Fahrenheit so that uh, the, the tubes and the other parts in it wouldn't burn up, okay? So what about it? Could it be done? I don't know. I'm a political scientist, so I'm just imagining this. But the point that I'm making is that technological developments can be directed and can be shaped by incentives. If I were Barack Obama, if I were uh, the, the, in charge of the, the Department of Energy, that would be the technological innovation I would put as much resource in as possible because it would be transformative. It would be like the cell phone. It would be like uh, the, the, uh, the internet. It would be a, a tremendous technological advance. So that's one question. The other question is can we develop a waste-free and less capital-intensive form of nuclear power? Well, we could. I mean, that's another avenue that we could follow to generate uh, power, maybe not within the household, but maybe within the district. What if, the, what if you had every neighborhood in New York City, all 59 community boards, had a little power plant, a little waste to energy plant, took care of all of its garbage and all of its energy needs uh, inside a building the same size as uh, the, you know, uh, a small pumping station for the water system? You know, we could even make it look nice and open up a cafe outside of it, right? The next question, how do we make the transmission process smarter and more efficient and more open to decentralized transmission? We know that we can do that. The technology's there now. Can we learn to collect and store the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels that will continue to burn? My friend Klaus Lochner says, he's a professor in the engineering school, that we use more stones today than we used during the Stone Age. We use more wood for fuel today than when wood was the main source of fuel. And he says we'll use more fossil fuels in the future than we use today. So even as we make this transition to other sources of energy, in all likelihood, we're gonna to continue to burn this stuff for a while. And we already have an accumulation of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the outer atmosphere. And Klaus and his colleagues are developing technology to suck the carbon dioxide out of the air and store it uh, underground or use it for productive purposes. And so that's another technology uh, that is a challenge, but is one that's required to deal with the energy issue. Okay, so that's the technology. Let's turn to the dollars. 
How do we pay for all of this? I think the climate and energy policy can modernize our economy's technological base and ultimately increase our standard of living. Now, this is an interesting thing. There's always been this idea that somehow if we impose new technologies through regulation, it will increase our costs and make us poorer and decrease our standard of living. Nothing since 1970, when we started regulating the environment in earnest in America, bears that out. Every single technology that we've imposed, uh, air pollution technology, water pollution technology, catalytic converters on cars, everything else that we've done, none of it has had the impact on the economy that people said it would have. Okay, why? Because these technologies end up providing benefits that people often don't predict, and one of the benefits is actually that we're healthier. You know, the, the, the air and water is healthier than it used to be. And so, and we're able to attract people to live here uh, because of that. So our goal in the energy side should be to reduce the percentage of our gross domestic product devoted to energy expenditures. Now this is the fundamental number that we should be keeping our eye on. When you talk about wealth generation, you look at the input side, the throughput, and the output of production in the system. Energy, like labor, is an input into our gross domestic product. In 1970, 8% of our GDP went to energy to fuel the economy. That grew to 13.7% by 1981, and then because the economy was growing rapidly and the price of fossil fuels was dropping rapidly, it actually went down to 6% in 1999. Went back up to 7% by 2000. By 2006, the last year I have data for it, it went up to 8.8%. Um, what I've heard is, is it's approaching 10% today, okay? Although I don't have data on that. This is the hard data that I have available to me. So what does that mean? It means that if we want to get back to 1990s kind of wealth, one way to do that is to start working on this percentage. And you can do that in a number of ways in your equation. You can grow the economy, which helps. You can lower fuel costs, which is another help. Um, if you increase the mix, of low-cost renewable energy into your mix, you may, in fact, reduce this GDP number. Fossil fuels will continue to get more difficult and more expensive to extract. And the long-term costs of renewable energy and energy efficiency are lower than those of fossil fuels and wasteful energy practices. And this is the other issue, energy efficiency. We waste about a third of the energy we use in America from the time it, it gets into our house. This doesn't include transmission waste. Within our households and commercial establishments, we, the low-hanging fruit of the climate crisis is energy efficiency. You know, think about it. You go to a hotel in Latin America or in Europe, and you walk out of your hotel room or in Asia, you walk out of your hotel room with your key and the lights go off, okay? We don't have those in America. Why, do we not know how to turn off lights, okay? A very simple technology. You go to a hallway with motion detectors. Lights come on when you're there. They go off when you're not there. On and on and on of different kinds of technologies. Uh, as energy efficiencies become more and more of a parameter in the design of refrigerators and air conditioners, they go down rapidly in their use of energy. Uh, today's air conditioners use considerably less energy than air conditioners used a decade ago. In fact, the argument is if you have an old air conditioner, you replace it with a new one, a couple of summers you've paid for it and reduced energy costs. Okay? So energy efficiency is clearly one thing that we need to do. Uh, now, renewable energy requires capital and is going to involve higher costs in the short and long term, and middle term, but in the long term will reduce costs. Now, in New York and in California right now, every kilowatt hour of electricity has a surcharge on it. Uh, in, in California, it, it generates uh, over a billion dollars a year. In New York State, it generates about a half billion dollars a year, which goes back into projects. In California, the utilities distribute it mainly to consulting firms. In New York, NYSERDA gets most of it, but Con Ed gets some of it. And it goes to projects that uh, come to the commercial, small commercial and household level to try to generate energy efficiency. That's something that we can do easily. But financing renewable energy is a more complex problem. The problem is fossil fuel prices are low. Uh, and they don't include the price of the external damage 
that fossil fuels create. Renewable energy projects are typically smaller and also have new technology. Now, there's a problem in financing new technology because the investor doesn't understand the technology, doesn't have faith in it, and doesn't want to invest their scarce capital. Remember, capital goes after the highest rate of return. It's like you know, gravity and a river. The water flows to the, to the lowest point. In this case, it flows to the point of highest return. So new technology is often something that only a very brave investor will put their money into. And so uh, that becomes a problem for the finance side. The, the absence of accurate and standardized information about renewable energy projects is a barrier to the growth of capital. Uh, we, we don't collect good information on the technologies or the rate of return. Now, there's a lot of talk about a tax on carbon. By raising the price of fossil fuels to make it possible for uh, renewables to become more competitive. I am convinced now that that's the wrong approach. I don't think we should try to raise the price of fossil fuels. I think we should use government intervention to lower the cost of renewable. One of the students here before mentioned Rather than taxing uh, the old stuff, let's incentivize the new stuff and create an incentive by bringing the price down. So that's the kind of thing that I think is possible. But again, we're in a recession right now, even though technically we're not. I mean, they say the economy's been growing, but unemployment hasn't been coming down. Capital availability is certainly not the way it was a couple of years ago. And so financing something speculative like renewable energy is difficult during this time period. But let me turn to organizational capacity. And here, it's having the technical capacity to do the energy efficiency projects, to install the renewable energy technologies, to take the more cost-effective furnaces and install them. And if, if somebody's used to in, installing the old stuff, they have to be trained to install the new stuff. It's not rocket science, but it is a technological change. I mean, this happens to people that maintain autos. We heard about this uh, during looking into the, the New York City transportation case earlier tonight, that teaching people to, to work on hybrid engines is different uh, than a pure internal combustion engine. You have to figure out a way to do that. Um, the need, there's really need for much more skilled labor in solar and wind, and that has to be developed. Um, there are a number of companies that are building energy efficiency services. There's one type of company called the Energy Service Company, or ESCOs. And what an ESCO does is they will do an energy audit, find some low-hanging fruit, lend the person the capital or the industry the capital to make the change, and take their payments on the reduced energy costs. And uh, it's a complicated scheme, but it does work. One of the problems with ESCOs is that sometimes their financial interests are not the same as their clients' interests. Their job is to make money on your energy savings. So they may propose things that are not as in your interest as you might want them to be, because they're lending you the money. You know, always beware of people that bring you capital and say that it's free. Okay? Anybody that brings you capital and says it's free uh, is uh, not entirely being is not being entirely honest. So there's always a cost to it, but it might be in your interest. If your interests line up with the ESCO's interest, then it's worth doing it that way. ESCO's can help small businesses that don't have sufficient capital, and they can work to ensure that energy efficiency projects generate short-term savings, because that's how they make money. But it will constrain the types of projects that they'll propose, because they're interested in making their money back and getting out. Uh, the shorter uh, the, the turnaround time, the better. Uh, and that may not be the best thing for you and your business. Organizations that are involved in the renewable energy business tend to be under-resourced right now. It's an emerging industry with no clear leaders. That may change. You do see a lot of the fossil fuel companies like Shell and others getting into this business, but they're not there yet. We need staff that are skilled in these new technologies, but uh, you know it's not going to be easy. And then, of course, there are political problems. Uh, citing a wind uh, farm off the coast of, say, Nantucket uh, isn't that easy because uh, I understand the Kennedy family in particular doesn't like their view to be obstructed. Uh, they've lived uh, out there for a while, and when they go to the shoreline, they don't want to see windmills. They want to see seagulls and 
you know, and vistas. And so uh, that's a problem. Let's talk about government and public policy. Now, government has played a role in the energy business for a very long time. First, gas and electricity generators. I mean, in New York City, Con Ed, I mean, the Ed was Edison, Thomas Edison, the guy that invented this thing called uh, power generation. And uh, that utility uh, was formed by getting a monopoly initially from the city of New York to distribute uh, and generate uh, electricity. Um, and so the energy industry has always been regulated, has always been involved with government. Uh, the public utility commissions, public service commissions around the country have long been involved in regulating the rate of return. Because if, you know, it makes no sense to have 10 different electric companies operating in one place. Now, a number of years ago, we separated uh, the energy generation and distribution business, but they're still essentially regulated monopolies. Um, and one of the obstacles to de decentralized renewable energy is there are many different rules governing access to the power grid. There may be a favorable rule in one place, a very difficult uh, and inaccessible grid uh, in another place. And clearly, as we, one of the things that government can do is invest in smart grid technology that allows for decentralized energy. And that really will be one of the most important government policies. It's, it, it's very similar in energy terms to building the interstate highway system in the 1950s and 60s. We need to have that kind of technological change uh, in our uh, power generation. So we need that. We do have a growing set of policies in place uh, to develop and promote energy efficiency. Uh, that part of the policy equation is pretty uh, non-controversial. Why? Even the, they, the, first of all, they've made it in the interest of the electric utilities to promote this. Con Ed does not make its money on how much more electricity it generates. It's a fairly complicated uh, equation, but if they can save per capita use of energy, they get rewarded by a bonus on their rate. And so that becomes part of, of their incentive to promote energy efficiency. Um, it's hard to argue against it. What's the argument against energy efficiency? We should waste as much as possible. Uh, we should spend more money on energy instead of becoming a more efficient economy. Uh, that part of the policy equation uh, hasn't been uh, too problematic. Policies have been set to require buildings, vehicles, and appliances to meet energy efficiency standards. That's government regulation. Uh, programs are funded by surcharges on utility bills, and they have increasingly encouraged uh, best management practices. In the case of renewable energy, tax credits are used to encourage development and the use of renewable energy facilities. We can use the tax system to make those risky investments pay off faster uh, and suck capital into uh, those uses. Uh, you can use things like the municipal bond market, where the interest is tax-free to the recipient who's benefiting from that uh, to encourage more investment in these kinds of technologies. Accelerating the use of renewable energy is going to require a lot of government activity. Government has to fund the basic research and development. Government money has to go into that low-cost solar cell, that small solar cell, and that battery. Because uh, the private sector doesn't have the resources and won't spend the money for something with that long a turnaround time. Uh, government has to alter the cost advantage of fossil fuels, but again, my own view of it is not by raising the cost of fossil fuels, but by lowering the cost of renewable energy. Now, that's not uh, an accepted part of economic wisdom, but I think that is something that we're going to see a change uh, because, the, because raising the price of fossil fuels just seems to be too hard. And with the increased natural gas availability, I think it's really not going to happen. Organized momentum, entrenched interest, and institutional inertia makes it difficult to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. There's just a lot of vested interest. Every gasoline station owner in America is a vested interest promoting fossil fuel use. All the people that operate and own all that infrastructure you know, are going to resist anything new coming in. And so there's also lots of money in fossil fuels. The, you know, these BP and Shell and so on, Exxon Mobil, they make a lot of money. And they have a lot of political power. And so if there's going to be change here, it's going to only be because there's a counterforce 
in society that pushes it through the political process. So government has to use the tax system to encourage investment in renewables and to try to provide access to lower cost capital and to try to encourage entrepreneurs to put their capital into renewable energy. So let me conclude. The transition from fossil fuels is the most important element of a sustainable economy in the planet. This is the heart of the issue. In the US, it's going to take a major effort by government and a real partnership with the private sector. And I should mention, the US isn't alone in this. Europe is working on this. China is working on this. You're seeing this in Latin America. All over the world, this technology is being worked on. And people are paying attention to this changeover. But if you solve the energy problem, you solve the water problem, because you can desalinate and transport water wherever you need it. You solve the food problem, because food basically needs water and nitrogen. And those things can be solved by solving the energy problem. And of course, climate change and ecosystem destruction is all helped by solving the energy problem. 